the time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation live on TV1 Monday at 9.30 p.m. We meet you at your doorstep. At a time Sri Lankan politics has somewhat taken a U-turn, we decided to talk about what is brewing in the tea industry in Sri Lanka. A few weeks ago, 53 factories were nabbed uh, for the adultering of tea, the manufacturing of tea. And just what does this really mean for the tea industry in the country? Does it mean that you are at risk? Is the industry at risk? What steps will the authorities take to arrest the situation? At a time, Sri Lanka celebrates 150 years since the birth of the tea industry in the country. Will we survive another 150 years? To discuss all this and more, we've invited four guests to our studio this evening as well. Let me quickly introduce them to you. Joining us uh, this evening on the show is Rohan Fernando, former president of the Tea Export Association of Sri Lanka. Nice to have you on board, Rohan. Also joining us uh, on the show for the first time is Dr. Rohan Pityaguda, former chairman of Sri Lanka Tea Board. Nice to have you on board as well, uh, Dr. Pityaguda. Also joining us uh, on the show tonight is... Uh, Jant Karanathan, Chairman Tea Exporters Association of Sri Lanka. Nice to have you on board as well for the first time, Jant. All joining us tonight is a very vocal uh, Roshan Rajure, former chairman, Planters Association of Ceylon. Nice to have you on board as well, uh, Roshan. So let's start off tonight's show with uh, Dr. Rohan Pityaguda, former chairman of uh, the Sri Lanka Tea Board. Uh, Dr. Pityaguda, let's start with the bolts and nuts of what exactly is happening in Sri Lanka at present. But before that, I want to pose a question to you. Uh, just a few weeks ago, you resigned as the chairman of the tea board of the country. Tell us why. Uh, basically, I'd been there for two and a half years and I felt that it was a time for some new thinking and new blood. I don't believe in sitting in a job for too long. Uh, when I run out of ideas, I think it's time for a new person to come in and start doing something. And that's that's basically why there's no controversy. Uh, Dr. Bidhi, you stepped down at a very controversial time as well. Just uh, during your latter stages, uh, you were able to nab 53 factories which were adultering tea in the country. And you said that a new thinking is needed. And everyone starts thinking, is this why you are moving out? No, not, not at all. I, I think uh, the timing of my departure was set uh, in October last year. That's when I indicated to the minister that I wanted uh, to leave and I think a new person should have taken over. Uh, the, the people whom we apprehended involved in adulteration had been watched by the tea board for a long time. It's just that it was difficult to catch them. But we uh, devised a new way of detecting sugar in tea, uh, added sugar in, uh, through an adulteration process. And we implemented that just in one morning uh, by surprise and caught these factories that we had been watching in any case for a long time. So this is the first time in the Sri Lankan history, if I'm correct, that 53 factories were nabbed. It's a remarkable thing. Uh, in the past two and a half years, I think about 20 factories have been caught uh, with sugar on the premises, which is prohibited. We don't allow them to have a mass of sugar on factory premises because some factories a very small minority, I think about 5% of factories are involved in this, uh, of adding sugar in order to increase the blackness of the tea and improve what they call the twist, so it has a better appearance. Because many tea buyers buy tea based on the appearance rather than just the flavor. And because of that, uh, these factories do something that's fundamentally illegal in order to try and get a higher price at the auction. And this is deceiving the consumer. And that's why we decided to act very uh, harshly, apprehend these people. And the normal practice is to suspend them for at least three months. Uh, my recommendation would be to put them out of business because they shouldn't be in the business of manufacturing tea if they're doing something illegal. So you speak of, you speak about a suspension of three months. Was this suspension served on the 53 factories? No, we go through a process because you have to be fair. The tea board is, on the one hand, it's the police. It, it does the detection. On the other hand, it's also the court of law because it makes a final uh, adjudication on punishment. So it has to be very fair. So what the first step is, is to serve a show cause notice on the factories, give them time to show cause, then have an inquiry with outside representation so that 
people can show that, uh, make representation as to why they are innocent, and after that, take a decision as to what punishment should be imposed, if any. Have all these steps been taken so far? The show cause was served, and after that, I believe uh, the matter. How long ago was this? The show causes were issued about, I think, two weeks before I left, so probably end of February. Um, but after that, since a new chairman came in, I think he needs time to get uh, uh, moving on the job and uh, and find his own feet. So I guess there might be. Will the issue be swept under the carpet, Dr. Pitiago? Just as we see on many instances in Sri Lankan politics, will this happen uh, as far as the 53 companies or factories are concerned as well? I hope not, and I don't think so, because the minister himself has taken a very strong stand on this right throughout. From the time I went into the tea board, the minister, Navinda Sanayaka, took the view that he wanted a clean tea industry. So I don't think he's going to condone these people either. I think it's just a question of the new chairman moving into the job and finding his feet. So it will take another one and a half years or two years for him to settle down in his new job, isn't it? I think he's a quick learner. It will happen <laughs> in a few weeks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Pateva, the former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. We, of course, will uh, grill Dr. Pateva further as to uh, what does it really mean by adultering tea and what sort of effect uh, it has on the consumer at the end. I now move my attention to... Um, Rohan Fernando, former president of the Tea Export Association of Sri Lanka. But before that, I need to mention to our viewers, uh, we did also try to contact uh, Mr. Ranjan Walpula, a tea factory owner who challenges the methodology adopted by the Sri Lanka Tea Board uh, for detection of adulteration. We also tried to contact uh, Dr. Ziad Mohammed, who was uh, uh, an ex-member of the Tea Research Institute for their views on this subject. However, uh, Mr. Ranjan Walpole declined to appear on the show tonight. Uh, I really don't know why, but uh, I hope uh, it's uh, for the reasons that is best known for to him. Also, we tried to contact uh, Dr. Ziad Muhammad as well. However, his phone, his phone was switched off. So let's uh, move to Rohan Fernando, former president, Tea Expo Association of Sri Lanka. Rohan, you have been very vocal about the importation of tea, but now this is a new issue completely. Uh, if I ask you, how is it going to affect the tea industry as a whole, you may say it is quite impactful because right now Sri Lanka is facing a severe crisis with regard to good quality tea. But my question is going to be a bit slightly different to you. What does the future hold for Sri Lanka at a time like this? 150 years, we're talking about a tea industry that has survived for 150 years. Will we survive another 150 years if we go like this? I'm of course very confident, having survived for 150 years, Surviving another 150 years is not a problem, especially because people drink tea in the world. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how we will get our pure Ceylon tea concept, uh, you know, promoted among the consumer? That is the million dollar question. We have been always advocating that pure Ceylon tea is absolutely a ecologically pure product. Even in our advertising material, we say from plucking, to packing, it is processed without any form of additive, not even water. Now, to a product of that quality, when people start adding various substances like sugar, then we have a huge problem to, to grapple with. Now, what we have been seeing in the recent past, uh, some of the factories getting very uh, ambitious to produce a blackish color tea to get a higher price and adding these substances can only happen in an environment where it is highly controlled and there is some form of um, uh, the, the, uh, you know the state control coming in for import of tea so it's monopolistic situation that gives them the chance to do all these wrong things and put this tea into the auction you see the 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 global tea industry, the growing section, is year on year, there is a growth recorded 2 to 4 percent annually, whereas Sri Lankan tea industry is rather stagnant. In a situation like that, when the tea exporters have to depend on what is available at the tea auction, roughly 320 million kilos plus minus, you have no option you are forced to buy what is come to the auction. You remember the days in the 1970s when we had to go to the CWE and buy whatever that was available? 
Did we go away and say, no, no, this is not good? We had to buy those, uh, the uh, material that was smelling of kerosene oil. We had to do that because that was a controlled economy at that time. Unfortunately, tea is also going through the same situation, oh, which is very why unfortunate. Why do you say that? When you say this is the only option that is available, you know that for a fact that uh, Sri Lanka has allowed the importation of CTCT from India and other countries. So it's not closed doors per se. I'm, what I'm saying is it is closed to a great extent. I mean, what we profess is let it be liberalized with controls so that there won't be a monopoly created for one segment only to benefit. That is what we are saying. Have a, have a, have a experimental area where you can do the import, blending and re-export. Otherwise what will happen is we have to go out to make use of the market available. Ron, your, your, your answer to that question seems to be quite far-fetched. Why? Because we already have controls, we already have a tea board, we already have the customs who are taking good control of good companies in Sri Lanka. However, you have 53 companies that were nabbed during Dr. Pityagoda's time for doing a mishap. And you're saying, bring in controls, more controls, and who are you trying to protect here? Now, in, this, in the case of 53 uh, factories that have been caught, I think I, I, think I, I wish uh, my friend Pitya would have stayed on for a few more weeks or months to continue the process that he started. But unfortunately, they are now challenging these, some of the factories whether the system that they deployed or the, the process that's mm -hmm. in place is correct to be uh, called that they have done something wrong. They are, giving, they are bringing out various theories. Unfortunately, in our statutes, there is a mistake, a wrongful act, but there is no specific uh, the punishment given side by side, Thank you very much, which sir. can be implemented in a court of law. Thank you very much, uh, Rohan. We will get back to you. Uh, yeah. We will get back to you in a minute. Uh, we, of course, want to listen to the views of uh, each and every individual in the first round. So let me uh, move on to um, Roshan Raj, the former chairman of the Plant Association of Ceylon. I must mention to you that Roshan also works uh, in a private sector company. His views that he's expressing today is completely his own and not reflecting uh, the organization that he's working for currently. So let's talk to uh, Roshan now. Roshan, when Dr. Pithyagura said about adultering tea, uh, my attention quickly moved to you. I, I want to give you an opportunity because um, I know uh, you also uh, you also handle a few uh, plantation uh, sector uh, estates uh, in the country and you all too have a few factories. If I ask you uh, this uh, question, I probably may be, uh, may be uh, it, it may be not right, but still for all, I'm still going to ask you this question. Are you all also involved in this adultering of tea? And what does this adultering of tea really mean? Your time starts now. Actually, to my knowledge and understanding, I'm not aware that any of the regional plantation companies are in this list. I may be wrong, but to my understanding, uh, we have not been informed that any of our states are in the list. So, now when you say about adultering tea, uh, Dr. Pitewood spoke about um, having um, sugar at the factories, but when is this sugar being used? When you, when you, adult, adult, uh, when you go through this adultering process, when is the sugar used? The possibility is that uh, sugar can be introduced during rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the stage I believe that sugar can be introduced because all the other processes are uh, parts of uh, manufacture like withering and firing. So my understanding is if anything has to be introduced, it has to be during rolling. Roshan, do you think that plantation companies in Sri Lanka have been doing this for some time now? Plantation companies? Plantation, like factory owners have been doing this for some time now. Well, uh, I, I really don't have the evidence or I don't have facts to say that they have been doing for some time. But I'm aware there have been a few misdemeanors and uh, timely action has been taken at that time. Now, this time round, there have been detections and as I think Dr. Petya going to mention, mm -hmm. I'm sure the due process will take place. Where are we standing at present? Uh, we, we have plant association of the country, uh, of uh, Ceylon, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the tea board, we have export association of the country as well. But 
Where is the factory owners falling in this equation? What now, is their responsibility? Factory owners, uh, form a different segment of the industry as much as the planters association has the regional plantation companies then we have the tea small holders yeah. the private tea factory association owners association so these are the three different segments in the producer supply chain when you really point the finger at the factory owners now about adultering tea there are a few segments in society who are not at fault but 53 companies are now at fault, that's for sure. So you say that the high growers, like the regional listed companies, are not involved in this process? Yes, to my knowledge and understanding, they are not involved. Roshan, where do we stand in this whole process right now uh, as a country? How do we move forward in your experience? Uh, I believe that uh, if you can look at the figures that Sri Lanka still commands a premium price for our tea because of the hundred year old reputation that we had for quality, for pureness and purity of our tea. So if we can put our act together house in order, I think we have a good future. The world looks at Ceylon for pure, uh, pure Ceylon tea. So I think we have a good future provided that we put the little uh, things in order at home. Uh, Roshan, we seem to be putting the house in order very late. And as a result of that, other countries capitalize. Example, the weed side issue that cropped up in yes. Sri Lanka. As a result of that, Sri Lanka has lost a significant amount of market share to a country like Japan. We seem to be doing it too late. I, I agree with you. Uh, weed side issue is a completely a self-imposed folly on our part. I mean, there was no reason to bring in a restriction on the use of a most popular, commonly used weed side in the world. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, uh, restriction was brought upon. And those uh, restrictions resulted in other weed sites being used. And as a result, uh, as all of us are aware, we have problem with uh, tea imports into Japan. And already I am told that we have lost about 30% of the Japanese market, which is a premium market, which we have cultivated uh, painstakingly over 78 years. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done now to restore the confidence and restore that segment of the market in Japan. Thank you very much, uh, Roshan Rajdure, former chairman of the Tantas Association of Ceylon. I now move to uh, Jayanta Karanatna, chairman of the Tea Exporters Association of Sri Lanka. Your job is the most difficult job as far as the four panelists are concerned. You're the sitting president of the Tea Exporters Association of the country. Um, Jayanta, what sort of complaints have you got, not from the factory owners, but from the tea exporters in Sri Lanka? Yes, we have a serious issue. We have been talking to Dr. Petty Agoda many times. We told him that this is happening in the country and our teas are uh, adulterated. And, uh, you know, I think a few months ago we went to see him and we told him that, you know, this has to be stopped because our buyers complained to us. And we know very well these teas are adulterated and, you know, by looking at the teas, we know it's very black and very neat and you know it's heavy and uh, you know the people do you know it's it's obvious that they have added uh, many things into tea so and also we have we uh, most of our buyer exporters uh, get claims from some buyers we have uh, we always get claims from russia for having eastern mold in tea and also some shipments are, you know, stopped in, in places like Iran and Turkey. So those were stopped and, you know, some people had to bring those things, these back to Colombo. So, you know, we cannot always say it's, uh, you know, we could not really tell exactly what the reason, but we knew it was sugar and, you know, the things added uh, into tea whilst, uh, you know, manufacturing. So we took it up very seriously with the tea board. And uh, we told Dr. Petyagoda that, you know, you have to do something because we, as buyers, people say to stop buying those tea. As much as possible, we try to avoid buying those teas. When we see those are black and, you know, adulterated. But it is not easy. You know, there are different kinds of exporters who want to buy cheap teas and, you know, buy, want to buy anything. So those kind of people buy those tea. But definitely those teas uh, get discounted at the auction. They don't get the correct price for the tea. But, you know, the, the, but it has to be stopped because, you know, one day 
one country as what happened to in Japan will stop buying our tea. You know, the, we already have issues, you know, in many countries. So they'll have to stop buying our tea. So uh, because of this reason, this need to be stopped. Uh, Jadi, you speak about um, adding many things into tea. <coughs> My thinking initially was only sugar. So they add anything else to the tea? The rolling we, as well? we hear that glucose and something, you know, similar things, sugar and various other things. Uh, are added up at the time of manufacture. Sugar is the main, but you know, something similar to those are added up to get the, also they get the weight also, additional weight by adding these things. So they, they have a big advantage, you know, for adding these things at the cost of the Ceylon tea name. So they know very well this is, uh, you know, it's going to kill the market, kill the industry. Uh, Jad, I have a I have very quick question before I open the floor for questions from our journalist. Uh, so the tea that is coming into the auction is carefully selected by the tea board as well. They go through this particular tea in question. Now you say as an individual, you see the tea at your warehouse or even your tea room and then you decide, okay, this tea is being adulterated, so I'm not going to use this tea and you discount it. What is the role of the tea board? What are they doing about it? No, you know, for a week, you know, we they auction about 12,400 lots. Tea had tea board has no facility to check all the samples, but they do random checking and they withdraw samples, but they don't go through all the samples. So you know, also Ajanta, it's, it's amazing because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Doctor Pathyagoda. Uh, during your time when this uh, raid took place, you all raided 80 tea factories. And you all found out 53 <laughs> to be adultering tea. But that's not a random 80. That's these not were, random 80. These were names that we had been watching for a long time right. because of uh, tip-offs being given and information that right. we received. I think the proportion of factories that are involved in adulteration is not as So you as took a bold decision. You took a bold step, uh, Dr. Pethyagoda. Probably you knew that you were leaving and hence you took a very bold step at that time. No, I completely disagree. I, I think <laughs> all these three gentlemen would agree that I was never one who was afraid to take decisions. <laughs> Um, I, 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 agree with, um, I agree with you on that count, to be very honest, Dr. Pethyagoda. I have had some experience as well and uh, I've seen the way in which you've handled uh, most of those incidents. But the question is, so you had 80 companies that were back blacklisted in your books, in the books of the tea board. 53. 53. 53. 80 altogether, you said. We, that, we uh, tested 80. You see, the problem is this, yeah. that we had a new method for testing the tea. Right, okay. Because we decided to test it during rolling. Okay. And if the bad factories got to know how we were going to test it, they would have started cheating against that test. Right. So we tested all these factories in the space of about two hours on one morning. It was right. a surprise raid. Right. You can only do that once. Right. So, uh, Dr. Pedro, my question to you is, you as an individual are quite, is, is very honest and you, have, you are a man with a lot of integrity. The question is, the officials attached to the tea board, where do they stand in this equation? Because the allegations that have been leveled against many individuals in the industry is the fact that there are corrupt individuals in every sector and there is no exception within the tea board of the country as well. When we speak about, uh, when Jayanta spoke about uh, tea, fa tea export associations or export companies buying tea which are bad in quality, that means it, it is being exported out of the country by some companies. So they are exporting it either under the women fancy of uh, certain sections of the tea board or certain sections of the customs in Sri Lanka. So, can you trust the tea board officials to do a good job, in the future at least? Yes, I do. You know, just the example of these uh, 80 raids that we did that morning, there were about 40 odd staff involved in that. At any point, any of them could have just taken their mobile phone and called up a factory and said, we are coming to raid you. Right? If they were on the take, that's what they would have done. But they didn't do that. The fact that we had 53 detections that morning means that our staff were fundamentally honest. And so, you know, you might get one or two dishonest, uh, corrupt individuals in every government organization, but by and large, I, I have complete confidence in the tea board staff. Mind you, I'm not there any longer, so I can afford to talk freely if I want to now. But I had no experience of any of our staff being dishonest. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pithyagut, as well as uh, Jayanti Karanath, the chairman of the Tea Exporters Association of uh, Sri Lanka, you open the floor for questions uh, from our journalists, but again, I need to remind our viewers 
uh, we did uh, try to uh, contact uh, uh, Ranjan Walpula, who is a tea factory owner who has been very vocal and challenges the methodology adopted by the uh, tea board for detection of adulteration as well as Dr. Ziad Mohammed. Uh, however, uh, both uh, one of them uh, did answer and refused to uh, be on the show and Dr. Ziad Mohammed he did not pick up his phone as his phone was switched off. I opened the floor for questions from our journalist. Uh, onto my immediate left is Charita Fernando and onto my far left as always is Nabi Majid. Uh, it's quite hilarious when uh, Dr. Pitya would have said about um, individuals in the certain individuals in the um, in the government sector are corrupt. Uh, if you want to see uh, 225 of them, you just have to go to the parliament and <laughs> there you go, you have at least 225 easily detected uh, in the government. So let's open the floor for questions. Let's start off with Charitha. Thank you, Shamir. Uh, my first question is to uh, Mr. Karna Ratna. Now, uh, exceeding levels of residue and adulteration, are these two different things or is it the same? No, those are two different things. I think those you are talking of MRLs uh, in tea and also adulteration at the, the factory or manufacturing level. Those are two different things. Those residues are coming from sites and pesticides and things like that. But adulteration is done purposely at the time of manufacture in the factory level. So Japan rejecting some of our shipments, it, it's based on uh, uh, adulteration or, or residue levels? Residue levels, MRLs. How much of uh, shipments have been rejected? How much has our uh, tea been sent back? Uh, I don't have the actual figures, but there was a time we had more than 150 containers on the way and being checked by the Japanese authorities. Few shipments were rejected. But if you look at this year from January? Yeah, all this happened uh, from January this year. So a uh, few shipments have come back. Uh, some people have taken, uh, you know, their products from the shelves, you know, to recall the products. Uh, some sh few shipments have come back. Uh, I don't have the exact figures. But now uh, what they do now is they test the samples before shipping uh, for the residue levels. So once it is within the limits only, they make the shipments. Uh, Mr. Rohan Fernando, now uh, is, is, is this problem uh, only in Japan or ha are, are there other countries that have complained? Do we have issues with other exporting uh, the, the countries? The problem in Japan is a compound called NC, NCP, MCPA. 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 Because that is a compound they are unaware of. So when they tested and found this, they could not understand why this happened in tea. But in other countries, we haven't had this same problem. But countries like Germany, they have increasingly testing for certain other residual uh, issues as well as any form of adulteration. So is, could there be a possibility of this, uh, you know, the same complaint coming from the EU? You see, what happens is when one country raises an alarm and it can go viral and then other countries can also start testing depending on their health regulations and their, and their limits that they have imposed on their food uh, controls. So that is the danger that we face. So that is why these things have to be nipped in the bud. Now the problem in Japan could have been avoided some time back because the Japanese government, when they found out the situation, they wrote to the to the Sri Lankan embassy. And when that, that, when that was, I think, about six, seven months ago. But unfortunately, that information was not conveyed. This is the information that we have heard, not conveyed to the government of Sri Lanka. So after six months, when there was no response, they implemented the system. Am I right? I think this is what I heard. And and and, 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 and and the problem is no country will immediately take action without giving a reasonable time for resolving an issue. So I believe they gave a time span to resolve this. But we were unable to resolve. And that's why this control or the ban came at a time that we could ill afford to have it. Dr. Pitya, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I just want to clarify the point. Yes. I think you know, we are discussing this without a context and the context is that the government through an act of 
gigantic folly in 2015 banned glyphosate which is arguably the safest we decide in the opinion of the Japanese and the European governments because they allow a greater residue of glyphosate in the case of the EU they allow two parts per million in case of Japan one part per million of glyphosate in the tea that they import so they consider it safe this is not my view this is their view and we banned the safe option now what alternatives are you leaving the tea industry at that point they have to now find replacement weedicides instead of glyphosate so they started using a weedicide which they are not supposed to use in such large quantities with tea this weedicide called MCPA now by comparison the EU allows uh, 0.5 ppm sorry 0.05 ppm 0.05 ppm of MCPA but it allows 2 ppm 2 parts per million of glyphosate in other words 20 times it considers glyphosate 20 times safer than MCPA in the case of Japan Japan's limit for MCPA is 0.01 for glyphosate it's 1 in other words 100 times they allow 100 times more glyphosate in the tea than MCPA now MCPA is the option that the tea industry was forced to go into so of course there were problems because the government didn't come and say there's an alternative this was just a draconian ban, a completely ill-advised Ill ban that was imposed which I consider to be the biggest blunder since nationalization that any government has imposed because don't get me wrong we have institutions to take care of these things when we have medicines we have the NMRA the National uh, Medi Medicines Regulatory Authority to de determine what medicines we are allowed to have we trust that body that's an institution that works similarly we have a register of pesticides an expert office that decides what pesticides are safe this is not a matter for politicians to get involved in because it takes expertise it takes education to make these decisions as to which pesticides are safe which medicines are safe we have institutions that take care of that and politicians should stay out of this and that's I, what caused the problem now we don't see the tea industry voicing their concerns uh, as you know one entity like the apparel uh, sector do you think that that really weakened the uh, you know uh, consultations with the government or no I, I, I disagree I think the tea industry was very vocal they, they certainly represented themselves very strongly at every level uh, the planters association the exporters uh, the factory owners everybody voiced their concerns to the government but the government refused to listen the minister of plantation industries put up three cabinet papers that were rejected trying to get this situation reversed but it was just obstinate uh, and a very obstinate head of government our president refused to allow this to be discussed uh, even in a sensible way Mr. committee after committee was being appointed with no response Mr. Rajadure it appears that Ceylon tea makes it to the news these days for all the wrong reasons uh, some time back we saw a consignment of tea being returned by Russia I think it was because of a certain bug that was allegedly in it uh, then we saw with uh, Japan, the issue with the residue of uh, MCPA. Uh, now we're hearing of uh, adulterated tea, about 53 factories which have been adulterating the tea. From a planter's perspective, do you feel that all of this negative press has had or will have a damaging effect on uh, the Ceylon tea brand? Yes, in the short term, uh, we did have some negative press, but we have been resilient enough to recover from that. Uh, talking of uh, this MCPA issue, I, let me add this. Now, MCPA is not a banned chemical. Uh, it is a permitted chemical, but there are certain limits and uh, regulations about the use of it. And all these years, up to the time glyphosate was banned, Sri Lanka tea had absolutely no problem about MRLs. And in fact, we were known as the cleanest tea in the world. That is because planters and plantation producers at every level strictly conform to the guidelines and the instructions given by the TRI. And in fact, I keep on saying that our TRI is far more stricter than the Indian or the Kenyan TRI is. In fact, for glyphosate, India, they allow three times as much dosage as we are allowed in Sri Lanka. So our, our TRI has taken a more conservative, more safe measure. So that is why we were able to maintain the Ceylon tea oh, when quality. When you say TRI, you are meaning the Tea, tea Research tea Institute. Research because research. they are the body that makes uh, frameworks regarding the dosage, timing and applications. Mm -hmm. So we have meticulously followed those guidelines and we have had no problem at all. 
You haven't heard of any instances where we had MRL problems, maybe one in a million. But in this instance, because of the unavailability of common use weedicides, I mean, how do you maintain 5,000, 10,000 hectares weed free? And we resorted to some of the most harmful practices, that is manual weeding, which is accepted the world over as a very harmful method of weed management. So, an uh, inch of soil, it takes about 300 to 1,000 years to build up, which by doing manual weeding, we send it down the, to the river in 10 or 15 minutes. So, that is a very harmful, uh, self-damaging uh, activity that we had to do. But in the meantime, I think as Dr. Petyago explained, the planters, the producers, the growers had to resort to some other means of weed control. And what happened was there were other uh, chemicals in the market that we had sprayed. And we found that MCPA levels high in those. And in Japan, I must clarify that. Now, we have gone through the Japanese uh, residue levels. They allow 10 times as much MCPA in the melons, oranges and apples, which they digest or which they uh, consume without cooking. But tea, of course, you have to boil and drink. What happened was they have set MCPA default level that is almost impossible to maintain because they believe that MCPA is not a weedicide that is used for tea. So there has been some sort of miscommunication. Now we have conveyed to the Japanese government and the health authorities. We hope that in the future that this will be rectified. Mr. So, Ratsubure, in the meantime, we, I was reading a very interesting article in the Sunday Times that had come up uh, shortly after uh, this issue surrounding the 53 errant companies came to light. And they had a very interesting title, Political Bourgeois uh, Destroying Sri Lanka's Tea Industry. Do you feel that there's a lack of accountability in the tea industry, especially to do with uh, these 53 companies in particular? Because it's alleged that no action will be taken against these companies because, uh, against these factories rather, because uh, of political influence and because there is political, there are political beneficiaries of, uh, in, involved in these companies. Well, I, I, I simply can't presume what is going to happen, but I must say that during the uh, crisis we face with, uh, without any weedy sites, the whole industry came together. I think I must thank all the stakeholders in the industry, particularly the CTTA, the brokers, the producers, factory owners all came together and supported the lifting of this illogical ban. So in one sense, I believe when there is a crisis or when there is a challenge, we all get together. But in the case of 53 factories, I believe that uh, some action will be taken in due course. Do you, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Do you think that the licenses of these 53 factories should be cancelled? <laughs> well... As a producer, I don't condone any additions, right? Uh, Cancelling the license, thereof, of course, the authorities should take a hard call. If it is the first time... Uh, Mr. Know. Fernando, I'll put the same question to you as a former president of the uh, Tea Exporters Association. Now, you buy tea from these factories at auction. Uh, so this is, in a way, when they adulterate their tea, they're compromising your product as well. Uh, the Tea Factory Owners Association has also come out strongly against these errant, company, uh, errant factories. Do you think that these licenses should be cancelled? I think we have to cancel these licenses. When there is a regulation, when there is a law, if you don't apply the law, I mean, where is the future for the industry? We have to be bold enough to call a spade a spade. We can't be just being very diplomatic and say, yes or no, I think if you do the wrong thing, if it is going to damage the Ceylon tea name, we have to take punitive action. Ajanto, where does the Tea Export Association of Sri Lanka standing on this, on this, uh, we, on this subject? We are fully, you know, we want to stop this, you know, not only the stopping these 53 companies, but you know, I think I understand the, even the other factories also have started doing it now. We need to take some action very fast to stop them because otherwise it's spreading because they you know some people think that they can get a better price by adding sugar so we need to take a disciplinary action you know Mr. Karuna, uh, uh, you just heard Mr. Fernando say that you know you need to call a spade a spade and the law needs to be enforced uh, the plantation industries minister uh, Namin Disanayaka had indicated that they wouldn't go as far as cancelling the licenses this was before the new year he had said 
uh, you know, cancelling the licenses will only harm uh, the workers uh, at these factories. And it's the new year, so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be too harsh. Do you think that this was the right stance to take? Do you think it's the correct stance? Uh, I don't think that is correct, because those factories, you know, the people and the tea will go to another factory and teas will be manufactured. So nothing will get lost by stopping those factories from manufacturing. Uh, and, you know, we also believe that if an uh, exporter is involved in this kind of thing, you know, we should stop them because they are killing the industry. They are the, the bringing in the bad reputation to the, the tea industry because they are 150-year-old industry and, you know, a lot of people depend on this. For few people, for hundreds of people, there are more than two million people live on this business. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Petya, go to during your... I want your... to rephrase yeah. my, what I said, cancelling. Uh, we, at this point, it is only uh, announcement that 53 factories have been caught adulterating. But I think, in fairness, they should be, they must have proper investigation and determine that they have actually done it. Because until a man is proven guilty, he is innocent. So they have, to, they have to go through the correct procedure of finding whether they have actually done it. Because nobody knows who, what these factories are. These factories' names are not known. Dr. Pethe Goda, there so was... So they have to go through the process and take punitive action. Dr. Pethe Goda, there was, uh, in the same article that I was referring to, it was also said that, uh, you know, when questions were raised about the methodology of these investigations and these raids, uh, and that, you know, sophisticated methods were used to test the tea. Do you feel that as a former regulator of the industry, and this is a problem that a lot of regulators in Sri Lanka seem to be facing these days, do you feel that there is a lack of support within the state structure itself when it comes to promoting accountability among these different uh, industries, no, and the tea industry specifically? I don't think so. Um, so let me just explain this very briefly uh, as to what's involved. All organic matter contains some kinds of sugar. So tea leaves naturally contain a certain amount of sugar. So the common sugars that are in uh, unprocessed tea leaves are fructose and glucose. Typically uh, a tea leaf will have about 0.5% of fructose and 0.4% of glucose. Almost no sucrose, which is the commercial sugar that we there is undetectable uh, sucrose. We've tested normal tea leaves at the tea board to find out how much natural sugar is there. So we have a baseline. Now these 53 people who were caught were in some cases 10 times, sometimes 20 times the baseline. There is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that they were wrong. That's why I wish that Mr. Valpola came here because then he, I could have argued this in his presence rather than in his absence. I'm quite happy to argue with anybody, to debate anybody on this matter because I'm satisfied as a scientist that our results are completely reliable and correct. However, when anyone is accused of an offence, they have a right to a defence. And I have to stand by that right as well. So that's why I think we have to look at the side, as Rohan says, the side of the factory owner as well because maybe something happened, an employee might have put the sugar on that day without their knowledge or there, there might be extenuating... But when, when the minister sort of you mentioned that there, everyone has a right to a fair trial, it's principles of justice. But when the minister comes up beforehand and indicates that you don't have to worry about your la license being cancelled, isn't that sort of promoting a culture of impunity? I'm surprised the minister said that. I didn't hear this particular statement. Uh, I'm not saying this because the minister is my nephew. I have full disclosure. Um, I, I have argued with him on many issues, including uh, similar ones to, to this one. I'm surprised that he said such a thing because in my whole time at the tea board, he supported me 100% in taking action against errant factories, in, including in some cases which were politically very sensitive and embarrassing to him. So uh, I'm surprised that he said that I, he might have been misquoted or he might have been uh, saying something for a political reason. Dr. Vidyavar, you speak about the sugar content in tea. Now we know tea is an excellent option if you're concerned with your blood sugar levels. Now let's talk about these uh, 53 companies and what they are manufacturing or producing. So does this mean that the content of sugar in this tea is high? No. Um, that is the catch. You see the problem here is that the, the sugar by these illegal people, a small minority, I keep emphasizing this is 5% of the factories. There are 700 factories producing tea in Sri Lanka. 
53 is a very small percentage of those. So the, this is a criminal element which we have to get rid of. This is a cancer to our tea industry and we have to get rid of it. I, I differ from uh, anyone who says that we should shut a blind eye to this. These people have to be put out of business, full stop, if they are guilty. Having said that, when the sugar is added in the rolling process, the tea then gets fired. In the firing process, the, the sugar turns into caramel. So it doesn't go to the consumer as sugar, it goes as various polysaccharides, which are caramels, uh, and it doesn't sweeten the tea as such. So I, I don't think uh, it has that effect. But the problem is we guarantee our consumers that pure Ceylon tea means pure Ceylon tea. We have uh, subscribed to the ISO 3720 standard, which means you cannot add anything, not even water, to the tea in the manufacturing process. So we have to give that assurance to the customer and stand by it because remember Ceylon tea fetches the highest price for black tea in the world. Our tea is more expensive than Indian tea and Kenyan tea by far. So, and we have to abide by that promise because why should people pay a premium for Ceylon tea if it isn't the best tea in the world? We have to give that assurance to the customer and any factory that doesn't stand by that principle of producing the best tea in the world should not be in the business of producing tea. Uh, Dr. Pritya, uh, just before we go in for a short commercial break, uh, again very quickly, uh, you spoke about uh, MCPN, you spoke about uh, the government not being involved, there is already a pesticides control uh, unit uh, within the government uh, ranks, hence they can do the needful and let them do a recommendation and hence then the government can take, can take a policy decision. And then you heard Roshan Rajdari mentioning about the TRI, the Tea Research Institute. Uh, however, with regard to adultering tea, the Tea Research Institute too is being very silent on this matter. Why? No, I, I don't think there is uh, uh, anything for them to say because the rules are very clear. The rules are you cannot add anything. So there is nothing really the Tea Research Institute can add to this debate. Now, now you say, also Dr. Pitevud, again before I move to the short commercial break, I just want to finish the subject and then open a new chapter complete when we start the third round. Uh, we speak about uh, the ISO 3720 standard uh, saying that no additives can be uh, added to the tea. So where does the monitoring system within the Sri Lanka tea board stand? So you say that you found tea uh, sugar sacks in these tea factories and then you just mentioned a couple of seconds ago that uh, it may have happened without the knowledge of the factory owners there is also a possibility. So where is the controlling mechanism, where is the monitoring mechanism within the Sri Lanka tea board? The, the tea board is, is, you know, the problem is because it's difficult to detect tea in ma uh, sugar in made tea. The earlier practice was that we used to raid factories and if we found actual sugar, bags of sugar or buckets of glucose in the factory, then we took action. Very difficult to find, but regardless of that, in my time at the tea board, in just two and a half years, mm -hmm. 20 factories were discovered with such uh, consignments of sugar in their premises and we shut them down. Every single factory was suspended immediately. No ifs, no buts. Right? After we suspend them, they can come and answer questions. And the TRI has stood by us. I think the TRI is a, is a very solid institution, completely underfunded, which I think you should discuss separately. Um, but they are a solid institution and they have been very supportive. So 20 of factories board. closed down during your time when you found sugar. Yeah. What happened to those 20 factories now? So at least three months suspension. In fact, some of those factories are repeat offenders in the 53. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for your thoughts in the first and second rounds. We're going for a short commercial break. We're t discussing about what's brewing in the tea industry in Sri Lanka. All this and more after the short commercial break. Stay connected. Stay with uh, Face the Nation. We are in conversation with uh, Roshan Rajdure, Jant Karunatna, Dr. Rohan Pityakuda, as well as Rohan Fernandez. Stay connected. Stay with Face the Nation. We will be right back. Welcome back, you're with Face the Nation. We start off the third round with uh, Rohan Fernando, former president of the Tea Exporters Association of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Rohan, um, I just want to uh, drag your attention to a statement that you earlier made. Uh, you initially said that uh, the licenses of all these uh, companies, the 53 companies have to be cancelled. 
several seconds later you say that I want to rephrase that and I want to say uh, you said that uh, there has to be a due process and then action needs to be taken. Yeah. My question to you is Rohan, why mustn't the licensors of these organizations which have been functioning for the last three months now since the invasion took place, why must Sri Lanka allow them to function? My point is in the first place if they were not cancelled that means they were going through certain procedure and now we have heard that they are challenging the process that was uh, you know deployed in detection so if there is a confusion as to whether they have used the sugar or not and if in the first instance of detecting if the license were not cancelled and now we have spent time from from February and none of these factories names even have been disclosed so there appears to be some form of confusion and ambiguity about the detection that is what I, why I said in fairness go through the due process declare these factories and they take the why are the names of these factories being declared these are, they these, these are, these are the question that we would like to ask why so now, now we as exporters is, would like yeah. this Bro matter to be resolved as soon as possible. Longer you wait, what happens is <laughs> this information goes in. Ron, goes are you saying that these 53 factories are currently manufacturing or producing tea at present, as we speak? We don't and know. They, they are not. They are not cancelled. They are still in operation. So that is where <laughs> the danger is. Longer you drag this on, the problem gets compounded, and then we have a bigger problem with our exporters. Now already we are getting. Uh, questionnaires from our exporters, uh, importers in Germany asking what is happening in these 53 factories? Have they taken action? Are they clean or are they guilty? Have they taken action? And, and we, are, we, are, we are at a loss to find out what has happened. So that is so why I said... Say, when you say that the due process must take place yes. uh, against these uh, companies, we saw the bond scam in Sri Lanka, 2015, 2018, nothing has been done. So when the due process takes place in Sri Lanka, does that mean that this government probably will be out of power as well and there will be a new tea board chairman, a new, uh, 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 a new plant minister? I, 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 I'm trying to figure out what you're trying to say. My, my uh, point is, yes. when there is a detection, when there is enough evidence, Either the T board has the power to cancel or you go before the court of law and file action, take an injunction or do the necessary uh, procedure to stop them from operation. Nothing has happened. So that is why as an exporter we are wondering whether they have been caught by mistake or whether there is actually they have been involved in adulteration. Thank but you very much. Dr. Petri Agora says he is very confident they have the, the, the adulterated the tea. So Thank therefore, for God's sake, take action. Thank you very much, Rohan Fernando, former president of the Tea Export Association of Sri Lanka. I have no option but to uh, start off uh, with you, uh, Dr. Rohan Pratyagoda, former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. Uh, Rohan sounds an alarm and it does make sense when he says, uh, why not uh, reveal the names of these 53 companies, at least then if they are manufacturing tea, Tea exporters can be careful and cautious when purchasing the tea. And why not? Um, <clears throat> the reason is what I consider natural justice. I, I think we have to be very cautious and have a presumption of innocence. I have the 53 names here. I have no intention of disclosing those names. It's, it's wrong to do that because until uh, an inquiry finds them guilty and uh, decides what action should be taken, we should not disclose the names. It's, it's, I think it's, it can harm the reputation of a factory that might just be innocent, just like the example uh, of uh, another RPC factory that had some sugar planted in it. However, <coughs> let me explain what this procedure was. The day the raids took place, we took samples from the various rollers, it's called duels. We took samples of multiple duels from each of these factories. Those samples were taken in triplicate. And a voucher sample of each duel was sealed, signed and handed over to the factory. Those samples are still with the factory. They can be tested even today. Another two samples were taken to the tea board. One of them was given 
for analysis. The other is even today in a deep freezer in the tea board, sealed and kept there. So there is no lack of evidence. The evidence is all there. It's just the will to test it. Now the question that some of these factory owners and one particular individual you mentioned, Dr. Ziad Mohammed, has been going around the country saying that it's all right to add sugar. In fact, the scientist from Peradeni University who assisted the tea board has been attacked by this individual, Dr. Mohammed, in Peradeni University, saying that he is destroying the tea industry as a result of helping the tea board to catch the culprits. So these samples are still there and even today they can be tested. And you can find out has is the amount of sugar elevated or not. It's very simple. But no factory owner is trying to test that. Some of the innocent factory owners have gone and had their teas tested independently and found that they are in fact innocent. The guilty people are dodging the issue and trying to fight it politically rather than allowing their teas to be retested and an open decision make, made as to whether they are guilty or innocent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Patel, the former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. I need to remind um, our four <coughs> panelists uh, this uh, evening that uh, if they do mention any names, they have to take full responsibility for the comments uh, that they are making. Just to a uh, quick reminder for our panelists uh, this evening about that as well. Uh, so let's uh, move to uh, Janta Karunap, the chairman of the Tea Exporters Association of Sri Lanka, uh, who is responsible for all the tea exporters in Sri Lanka. And uh, your comments and your views, uh, Jayanta, is going to be taken uh, to heart by all tea exporters who are watching this show at present. So you have a problem now. You have 53 companies. The tea board is not willing to divulge their names until otherwise they are found guilty. Uh, but that, again, is uh, a far-fetched uh, goal for a country like Sri Lanka because we've seen when corruption takes place, it takes at least... Uh, many many years until the guilty is proven so there is no expectation that the names of these 53 companies will ever be uh, brought uh, to light so the question is very simple what are the concerns that you have uh, as an exporter as well as the chairman of the uh, export association of uh, Sri Lanka so it's a it's a very serious issue to us you know our members you know always check with us whether we do we know the names of these 53 factories we cannot officially divulge these names because we don't know you know now we run the risk of using these teas and exporting and one day we will get caught it is not our company or you know maybe the particular company who ship it is Ceylon finally it is Ceylon tea will get the the the, 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 the will get blacklisted so it's a, it's a huge risk for the country for allowing this to happen. I don't know whether those 53 factories have now stopped using sugar. So if that case, in that case, it is good, then it is okay by us. But if it's continuing, but what we hear is other people also have started using it. So if it's happening, it is not to a particular company or a particular sector, but it is for the country, for the Ceylon tea. So this needs to be stopped. So we run that risk. You know, we always have been asking to whatever whatever action we take, this need to be stopped. Adulteration need to be stopped. So this is our view. Janta, you, you're also an exporter. Uh, you're also a private exporter in Sri Lanka. And, and you did mention to us before on the show, uh, as we progressed, you said that uh, when you see uh, the appearance of the tea, when you realize that this tea has been uh, adulterated, uh, you discard it and then move to uh, buying some other teas. Uh, when you find out, as the chairman of the Export Association of Sri Lanka, that the tea samples that you have that you get have been uh, adulterated, do you report it to the tea board? Not exactly. We don't why? do that. But you know, but why, why is that? No, because you know it, uh, we have been doing it in the past. But uh, you know, the, I I don't think anything happened. You know, not only for sugar, even for other things, the teas are coming below ISO 3720. We used to send samples to the tea board. On and off, they withdraw. You know, they, they, they check and withdraw those samples for auctioning. But, uh, you know, it is a problem to us because and we used to send a lot of samples to the tea board, the tea exporters. We collect samples and send to them with the details of the lot number, the, the, all the details. But uh, it was not very effective. It was, uh, you know, not stopping the problem. So, so who is responsible? Is it 
the exporters or is what it the tea board is, or is it the factory owners themselves? No, actually right now what's happening is the exporter take the responsibility. We have to take uh, our, our own responsibility of selecting the correct tea and use them. Uh, do you think, do you think, Jayanta, that the tea board has to do more in Sri Lanka? Tea board has to? To do more, has to do more. Yes, definitely they can. But actually it's, uh, you know, I personally feel the discipline should come from all sectors. The growers, the factory owners, all sectors, the brokers, they all have to take the responsibility. Only one particular, you know, association or the, the tea board cannot handle everything. It's a huge industry. More than 300 million kilos are produced. So I think it's practically not possible for them to monitor everything. But the discipline should come from all sectors. Now we, as exporters, we protect our business. You know, we protect our brands by taking all precautions. But they, they also should do that. But you're well aware, uh, Jan, that uh, every single kilogram of tea that is being exported uh, outside, uh, exporters pay a levy to the Sri Lanka Tea Board. And that is to protect the rights and to ensure that the promotions are done uh, for on behalf of the exporters in Sri Lanka. Am I right? Yes, yes. So the tea board do ha does have a responsibility. Yeah, but actually the there are two, three types of, uh, you know, assessments collected by the Treasury and a promotion and marketing levy is collected by the tea board that is for promotion and marketing. The cess is collected by the treasury and used for various uh, things, uh, including running of the tea board and for replanting and various other things. And the promotion and marketing levy is collected by the tea board for promotions of Ceylon tea. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, this promotion and marketing levy have been collected. You know, we, we are asking them to stop it. The tea exporters have asked tea board to stop that. But now the tea board has agreed to at least to stop collecting 50% of it from end of this year because we feel that it has not done anything good to us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll get back to you in a minute. Okay. Uh, but before I move to um, uh, our very vocal Roshan Rajdure, Roshan, with your permission, give me a minute to uh, quickly cross uh, question uh, Dr. Pithyagura. Dr. Pithyagura, uh, two points that uh, uh, Jayanthika did mention right now uh, a couple of seconds ago was the fact that uh, the levy that is being charged uh, by the tea board and then the promise that has been made by the tea board to uh, cut this by half. Um, isn't it the responsibility of the tea board? You say that you get 12,500 lots plus uh, to check, but isn't it the responsibility of the tea board to check at least half of it? Because there is a levy that is being paid, there is money that has been allocated, uh, so if there is adulteration of tea, the tea board has to be held responsible. So, <clears throat> I need to answer that in some detail. Yes. There is a levy of approximately 6 rupees and 50 cents that goes as a cess that comes to government. That amounts to almost 2 billion rupees per year. And it's that 2 billion that is used for the entire development and regulatory process of the tea industry. So about half that money, about 900 million, goes into the operating expenses of the Tea Smallholders Development Authority, the Tea Research Board and the Tea Board, three large institutions. The other half of that money goes into replanting subsidies, about 900 million rupees this year will go into replanting subsidies for the whole industry. So the, the Tea Board does have a duty to check the tea, but when you think of 12,500 cups of tea a week. It's a massive job to test. So the, the procedure that I adopted was I invited the exporters who examine the tea before they bid for it at auction. They get samples into their uh, warehouses on a weekly basis. I said, if you suspect any tea of being substandard, report that. And, and then, then Jad just mentioned that he has done that before and there has, it has been of no avail. No, no, I, I think you, you misunderstood him. So there's two issues here. One is the tea being substandard because, for example, it's high in fiber. And the other is, I think the question you asked him was regarding adulteration. Now, if he suspects adulteration and he reports that to the tea board, how do you test whether that tea has been adulterated or not? It's very difficult to test. Of course, if it is some adulterant that's very easy, like potassium 
permanganate or something, you can just dissolve it in water and find out whether it's there. But if sugar has been used as an adulterant, once the tea is made, once it's fired, it's very difficult to detect. So I'm trying to say, uh, Dr. Pithyagura, being a scientist and inventor yourself, with so much of technology and development and tests that are coming out in the world in this day and age, it's difficult to find whether the tea has been adulterated? It's expensive. That, that's the problem. Even these pesticide residue tests, each test costs upwards of a hundred dollars. It's about 17,000 rupees per test. And if the test is going to cost more than the tea, there's no point doing it. I mean, you can't have a viable industry like that. So the, there is a limit to how much you can test. That's why when you do catch a factory doing something wrong, you have to put them out of business. It's, it's a very right. important thing that everyone knows what the rules are. And remember, we have too many factories. The amount of tea that Sri Lanka is producing in terms of green leaf is not going up. It's coming down. The number of factories has been steadily increasing. And in my watch, thankfully, there were no new factories given permits. But in, in my opinion, the 700 factories we have is far too many. And so there is a good opportunity when you have factories doing the wrong thing, put them out of business. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Pethiagudev, a former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. I now move my attention to uh, Roshan Rajdure, former chairman of the Planters Association of uh, Ceylon. Roshan, during the break we spoke about, uh, spoke about uh, the issue of uh, adulteration. Uh, you said that uh, your task was difficult uh, during an instance in which there was sabotage at the factory. So when you take into account these 53 factories that have been uh, nabbed for adultering tea, do you think that there was sabotage right throughout the 53 factories? That's a bit difficult to no, fathom, no. isn't it? What I mentioned was uh, we had an incident soon after our uh, wage strike where one factory was detected and it was clearly proven that it was an act of sabotage mm -hmm. because about two packets of sugar was found in a waste paper basket mm -hmm. and the tea board was informed that it was there and they detected it. As a consequence, because the rules at that time, that factory had to be suspended. And uh, quite unwillingly though, we had to tow the line and we did it. So that is one incident I am talking of. So we're ta I'm talking about the 53 factories. Do you uh, think that there was sabotage right throughout the 53 factories? I don't That's think. hard to believe, isn't it? No, I, I also agree with you. I, I don't think it is sabotage all round. But what I am talking about, uh, I represent the, the RPCs. In our factories, our situation is quite different to that of the uh, private tea factory owners. Because as you are aware, our workforce is highly unionized. And on top of that, we are signatory to so many uh, certification processes where it ensures uh, human dignity and we just cannot keep on checking people or patting them and doing body checks. Anyone can bring in a uh, little bit of sugar into the factory and sabotage. That is the point that we, I tried to make. So we have taken every precaution to prevent any uh, adulterations in the factories so that we manage. So let me pose a question that was posed to you by Nadim just a few seconds ago. Do you think that it is right to cancel the licenses of these factory owners on the basis if they are found guilty, if an investigation does found, find them guilty in the next uh, few weeks at least. I think once, if you establish that it is a deliberate act of uh, adultering to gain unfair competitive advantage, I think I support the view that they should, there should be some punishment as a deterrent to others. But we have to establish their guilt. I was talking of an exception where there was a deliberate act of sabotage and we, we showed enough evidence to, to that fact. I'm not Thank talking you. of that, I'm talking of... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Roshan Rajdure, former chairman of the Planters Association of Ceylon. Today, very careful, uh, Roshan, when expressing your views. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm trying to figure out because uh, you're uh, an individual who's quite very vocal. Yes, and no, in, in, this, in, uh, comments, in this case, uh, I have also been involved in the industry for 35 years and we have a sacred duty to protect it for the next generation. But I support uh, what Rohan says. He says, find out whether they are guilty and yes, take action. There is, I mean, there's no other <laughs> alternative. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Roshan Rajdure, uh, former chairman of the Planters Association of uh, Ceylon. We have to... Uh, 
thank Roshan for the contributions he have made uh, for Face the Nation over the last uh, few months. He was one of the individuals who came on the show and very strongly said that the government's ban on weedicides is very illogical thinking. This was just after the ban was imposed in the year 2015. Uh, he was one of the individuals who was very vocal on this subject and thank you very much Roshan for expressing your honest opinion and we can see the results uh, at least now. Uh, we'll talk about the weedy side issue in, in a moment but I need to remind our viewers uh, based on the information that I'm getting <laughs> on the grapevine is the fact that uh, two strong uh, UNP ministers are also involved um, in uh, these factories. I don't want to mention the names uh, right now but uh, just to bring to light that uh, there is also some sort of political influence in the adultering of tea and there are several individuals uh, within the government ranks who also own a few factories. So let me open the floor for questioning from our journalists. Let's start off with Nadim. Thanks, uh, Shamir. Uh, Mr. Fernando, I'll come to you. The adulteration of teas a uh, tip of the iceberg of challenges currently facing the Sri Lankan tea industry. Uh, the reason I say this is because uh, we've seen the fallout that has come from the unilateral withdrawal of the United States from the Iran nuclear deal and the reimposition of US sanctions. Now, uh, European Union authorities have already taken steps to protect their business interests. Uh, there are others also who have gotten into business with Iran after the nuclear deal came into effect uh, who are finding ways to circumvent the US sanctions. Uh, now for Sri Lanka this is going to be very difficult. Uh, the uh, that new market that was opened up is now being closed off again. What do you think needs to happen to sort of offset this? Is there a way that we can continue to sell Ceylon tea in Iran? You know the question of Iran nuclear deal that was on the table from the day President Trump was elected. That was one of his election campaign promises. So we were aware that this was to happen sometime uh, subsequently to his uh, taking office as the President. Now I believe we always, as usual, wait till the debacle happens to go and take action. Now look at Iran and India and Iran and Sri Lanka. Iran and India have a very good relationship across on, 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 the, on the exchange of trade. They have a rupee to real uh, facility for the export. In fact, the Indian export to Iran has increased in the recent past. Whereas Sri Lanka does not have such a facility, but we have a the credit balance in their favor of something like 240 million on uh, uh, crude oil that we have bought and there's a credit balance. It may not be possible, but still I believe there is a possibility, a remote possibility to negotiate at least to set off some of this through export of tea. Now we must understand Tea is not a banned item for export because it comes under food and medicine are not banned under any sanctions for export. What is banned is transaction of dollars via New York exchange to come into any country. That is where the, the controls take place. Now even euro transfers are monitored whether they are coming from Iran or whether they are coming from banned, uh, you know, the sanctioned banks. When we met the U.S. delegation about several years ago, uh, just before the Trump administration took control, they were very uh, positive that the tea industry can look, you know, positive on the, the future of with Iran using this non-sanctioned tea for trading, and they assured us. The T is not sanctioned, but you have to find a bank that is not sanctioned to do the transaction. But that kind of thing doesn't. Do you think not it's possible. a possibility for Sri Lanka to work out a rupee to real? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether it will be possible to work out a rupee to real, but I still believe that 240 million dollars that we hold in credit balance for Iran 
will be the key factor that we can use and that we can explain that as a repayment uh, and use tea as a the, the bartered good for that. And I don't think there will be any sanction imposed on that. But I don't know how good our negotiations would be. I think that is where the, the secret lies. Other uh, than Mr. That, Kardner, we are you're also a, an exporter. How do you feel about this, the U.S. withdrawal and the... Uh, now, the during the last few years, we are having a problem of receiving money from Iran. So exports can go to Iran, but uh, money don't come to us direct because it's U.S., via to U.S. So people send money from different places, from different countries, and also the euro is sent from different places. Actually, the Export Association took it up with the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and even Dr. Petya Godas was involved in that. And we uh, requested Central Bank to come out with a proposal. So they had a kind of a negotiation with the German Central Bank to use a euro for to use for, for tea. But I think uh, our commercial banks have not agreed to work with Iranian banks, even though those are euros. So actually, the, it's the government of Sri Lanka, the central bank is, is willing to help us or willing to do exports and to get our money by using euro, but none of the commercial banks uh, why not? Are they afraid that they are afraid of uh, U.S. Sanctions. sanctions? Yeah, because uh, they they are afraid of uh, you know they they have uh, large businesses with U.S. so they don't want to expose them. Doctor Petya how how do you see us resolving this sort of problem? Because uh, it's it is a tragedy really because that was a market that yes. was opening up. You know the uh, different countries now Korea has a way of working with Iran India has a rupee uh, Europe uh, is coming up with yes. new ways of working but with I Iran. think Sri Lanka is very small I think uh, we have uh, have no way of whatever the and also I think uh, we can find a way of doing but what we needed is a very focused attempt to do this uh, if, we, if we can have a proper plan with uh, authority from the government of Sri Lanka, I think they can come out with a, with a proposal. Dr. Pethi, uh, Mr. Karnaratna mentioned that you were also part of that sort of uh, meeting with the central bank to figure out a way to resolve this. Do you see this being resolved any time in the near future? No, to be honest, I don't. Um, Dr. Kumarasamy at the central bank has been extremely proactive and helpful. Um, and the central bank has been closely in touch with uh, the German Bundesbank uh, to try to get a channel open. The problem is that commercial banks, whether in Europe or in Sri Lanka, are, are frightened of the prospect of U.S. sanctions against them. So I think on both sides the, there is a bit of an impasse. Countries like South Korea and India are so big that they can afford to take risks. Uh, if you think about it, even Sri Lanka, there was a time when we took such a risk in 1952 during the rubber rice pact. There were U.S. sanctions against rubber exports to China. We broke the sanctions and we got away with it. We defied the U.S. on that occasion. Uh, it, w it was a, a remarkable thing that we did then. I don't think that kind of political courage exists any longer. Well, we don't have that sort of soft power that we had back then, uh, right now. Uh, however, there are, uh, you mentioned that technically, technically, for the commercial banks too, if this is via the German Central Bank and if it is using euros, they would not be in violation of U.S. sanctions. So if, for example, the state banks uh, were to, the state commercial banks were to uh, offer the service, and if the business were to go there, the commercial, the private commercial banks would automatically fall in line, would they not? It's more complicated than that. Actually, it's, it's quite a complex issue. It's not just the banks that have to be regularized. It's also the people with whom we are doing the trade in Iran. Because there are individuals in Iran sanctioned. And if any of those individuals might be shareholders of the company with which we are trading, again, the bank could get into trouble. It's, it's a very complex issue. And I think, to be fair by the central bank, they've tried really hard to resolve this problem and fail. So, Dr. Pithagur, we have a question for you. It's quite a, a hypothetical question, but uh, we have viewer posing this question to Dr. Pithagur. Um says, um, can Dr. Rohan Pithagur conclude the fate of the 53 factories and establish his intervention for the future of the industry if he is given the authority? 
Uh, I'm no longer the Tibo chairman, so I'm speaking entirely as a private citizen. So if you are given the authority, the question is, if you are given the authority, uh, can you um, intervene and ensure the future of the tea industry in the country? I think the present Tibo chairman is quite capable of doing that on his own. He's a, he's a fine man. So you say that there is no political courage now. Now I'm trying to figure out. Sorry, I was talking about yes. <laughs> political courage at a national level. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm getting back to that. I'm getting back to that, uh, Dr. Patel. You say that there is no political courage now. So, what do you really mean by that? When you say there is no political courage, you you say that uh, Navin Sanayaka was is your nephew as well, and you speak about political courage. Now I'm trying to figure out: uh, Does the tea industry uh, in Sri Lanka have a future if we? don't have the courage or the political courage or the political will at least now to take the right decision. I'm hoping that everyone concerned will take the right decision. I also hope the minister will stay out of this because you see the act, uh, the Tea Control Act is very clear. The, this decision is something that has to be taken by the Tea Commissioner, not by the Chairman of the Tea Board or the Minister. It's the Tea Commissioner's call. The right of appeal then exists if a factory is aggrieved by the Tea Commissioner's decision to appeal to the Minister. That is the procedure that was followed while I was Tea Board Chairman. The Tea Commissioner takes a decision, the Chairman obviously endorses that. And if the factory finds itself aggrieved, then it can appeal to the Minister and the Minister has the last word as far as the law is concerned. I'm hoping that that will be the procedure that will be followed here as well. Mr. Fernando, uh, how, how does, uh, now for example, if say Germany or Europe, how do they test uh, tea is coming from Sri Lanka. What is the procedure? I think there are certain tests that you can perform. Is it a random thing that they do? or They do random tests, not on all, so far. Okay. So I think uh, so far we have been uh, fortunate that none of the shipments have got rejected. Uh, I personally believe we need more testing facilities in Sri Lanka because when you look at it, this was a gentleman's trade most of our rules or regulations are by convention and unfortunately this has you know gone out of the gentleman way of doing things so what we need now is more quality control systems to be implemented so i feel we need to invest in testing laboratories not in colombo but at regional level where we can test for sugar we can test for uh, MRLs and all sorts of other residual materials like insect infestation. I think that is the need of the hour if we are to move forward with Ceylon tea being ecologically POT. Dr. Petegra, how many accredited uh, laboratories do we have for this kind of test? So the word accredited is a loaded word, it's charged because it depends who has demanded that kind of accreditation. The Japanese Ministry of Health, for example, requires a laboratory that's accredited under the Good Laboratory Practices Scheme of the OECD. There's no laboratory in Sri Lanka that has that accreditation. That's not to say that it's a very high or special mm -hmm. accreditation. It just happens to be the one they want. So I don't think accreditation is the issue. There's at least five labs that are quite capable of doing what we need. The issue is not so much testing. The issue is good practice. If the factories just abide by uh, the good practices that have been stipulated by tradition and by the regulations of the tea board, we won't have a problem. This is a recent problem. So the, the pesticide problem, as Mr. Rajasuray pointed out, the pesticide problem is largely an error on the part of the government. So let's leave that to one side. A sugar problem is largely one that can be controlled, as I've just explained. So I think these are fairly simple things. You don't need to bring rocket science into this. It's a very straightforward technology that's needed to control this. And uh, Mr. Raja Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Fernando, you mentioned earlier that uh, some of your importers from Germany are demanding for answers as to whether these 50-odd uh, factories have been held accountable. So in the event that there is uh, there's no proper investigation or no deterrent, uh, could they be testing all RTs? Before come to that question, yeah. I want to tell, I think this was wrongly handled. I believe the minister went public too soon without taking punitive action. If he went public, he should have been in a position to say, these were found guilty, this is the situation and these are the factories. 
Now he has created the situation where 53 supposed to be factories have adulterated. But up to now, no action has been taken. So this is where the confusion is. I feel this was hyped at a time when it should not have been and this has gone viral. Now what is happening in Germany is they are conscious about what can happen. Now as Dr. Petya Gaurit says, once the tea the, 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 the is caramelized, it's very difficult to detect. What happens after that is it has a possibility of you know, absorption of moisture and thereby more growth. So that can happen after some time or very, very fine laboratories can still find the caramel residues or whatever, I don't know, I'm not sure of that. So right now we are on, on the edge of, you know, uh, worrying whether something can be detected in Germany or other places as a result. So we sincerely hope with our testing, local testing, tasting, that we can avoid this problem. Mr. Tarnalat, now, uh, when you export your uh, Ceylon tea, do you do independent tests? Uh, and is it done overseas or how do you set about it? Yeah, now, the, currently, the exporters to Japan, before they purchase tea at the auction, they send samples to uh, India for testing. So once the tests are passed, and with the, with the, with the and when it's confirmed, those are within those limits. Only they purchase the teas. So for Japan, they practice that before buying the tea. And uh, for bulk shipments, they test the then sample before shipping. Even to Europe, that was the you know it was not so strict in the past. You know we used to get uh, certain uh, laboratory test uh, before shipment. But now, especially for Japan, they. <coughs> do the test before purchasing tea. Can fungus develop as a result of adultering tea? Yes. It could? Yes. Has it happened before? We on and off get complaints from our buyers. That About fungus being developed in tea? Yes. So Dr. Pitya, well, that's a serious issue. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree. So what must the factory owners do? How can, how can the tea board uh, push the factory owners to the wall and demand for answers. So when you say fungus being detected in tea, that's a huge problem. I don't know any exporter, has any exporter brought this issue up to you? Uh, yes, yeah, we have uh, had uh, complaints, you know, not major complaints. There were no rejections as such, but there were customer complaints. And we have take, uh, discussed this at the CTTA level and also the tea exporters forums mm -hmm. uh, but though there were no rejections so the exporter has settled it by himself so but only thing is you know if it's happened at the point of customs or quarantine then there will be a major problem but you know now the complaints are coming from the consumer or from the distributor or supermarket or something so it's a it's a major problem it could lead to if they detect at the time of import we will have a serious issue. Mr. Rajadare, yes. uh, I want to bring to you another sort of long-standing issue that uh, faces the plantations industry as a whole and the tea industry specifically, which is the issue of labor and uh, wages. Now, last week, the minister, Navin Disanayaka, said that the uh, plantation companies, the plantation owners, have to be prepared for wage negotiations. Yes. Uh, now, we know that uh, several plantation companies have been pushing for a productivity-based uh, wage scale. Um, this has not been supported by many of the unions, uh, but what is the current sort of situation when it comes to negotiations with the unions? Are, you going to be, are we going to be seeing the implementation of a productivity-based uh, wage scale, or is it going to be a sort of collective bargaining? Well, uh, okay. At the last uh, wage negotiations, for the first time in about 150 years, we were able to incorporate an element of productivity into the wage model. I think it was a long drawn out wage negotiations. Uh, there was a lot of uh, issues and uh, for the first time, I, uh, it dragged on for such a long time. One of the reasons is that the industry was facing a critical situation. In fact, if you recall, at the time we were doing the negotiations, our cost of production was about 50 to 60 rupees more than the prices we were realizing. Fortunately, we are not in that situation today, 
but now that the productivity element has been introduced i think i believe now the unions also see the benefit of that and when you look at the numbers we see that the workers are earning far more than they did before because early it was a attendance based system where their mere presence in the field for eight hours uh, sort of entitles them to full days wage but now we have put in a system where they have to be measured by the norm so now they are driving for the norm in going for the norm of naturally they don't stop by the norm then they exceed and we found that the earnings of the workers have increased so at the same the time situation. we see I'll quickly ask this question because we're running out of time at the same time we saw that now in the first quarter of 2018 earnings uh from tea exports has sort of increased as a result of uh, one of the one of the key uh, causes being the depreciation of the rupee which may not necessarily be a good thing because it's not an increase in volume of export but with this depreciation of the rupee on the one hand the earnings of the plantation companies have increased in terms of uh, dot x number of dollars coming in so but at the same time the cost of living for the for those working in the plantation sector has also increased because of the de devaluation of currency so can we expect to through following these negotiations uh will there be a fair deal is what i'm saying that reflects both these factors i think if you look back on the history of wage negotiations we have always given fairly substantive wage increases always except in one rare occasion our wage increase has been more than the colombo consumer index and we have gone back if you go back we have given as much as 40% 43% wage increases <coughs> and i think over the last few wage uh, negotiations we have moderated we have given 20% plus any industry whether it's tea or any other industry we can only pay our employees out of the earnings so this time around also we will not uh, agree to something that we cannot go and honor because you can see the issues that we have in sri lanka various people go and promise so many things that they cannot deliver and we have wild cat strikes all over so i think the plantation industry has been very uh, sure of uh, what they can afford to give and we are committed to it and we have honored it without any breach up to now i mean we have never delayed even a single day's wage uh, in paying the workers so going forward uh, we have proposed certain wage models Uh, because i believe time has long passed its uh, due that we should have changed the wage model from the archaic system of daily based uh, attendance system and now we are proposing a revenue sharing model which i believe the unions should see the benefit long term benefit because we see people uh, leaving the industry because of so many other issues and it is my fervent hope that all the parties involved will come to some sort of a understanding and move forward So I'll industry. give Chaitanya the one question before we wrap up uh, tonight's show. Uh, yeah, one question, uh, Mr. Ajudar. Now all these issues uh, uh, re regarding uh, residue and adulterated tea. How will this impact prices in the Colombo auction? Well, in short, uh, we we had some crises like the residues and additions. I think we can easily rectify it because over the <laughs> 150 years we have shown ourselves to be resilient. research sold because two and a half years is somehow or other managed the wheat situation without allowing the situation to implode and go out of control and we will be resurgent i can assure you that thank you very much yes. gentlemen for your thoughts in the first second third and fourth rounds we're now going for a short commercial break when we come back it's a final round stay connected stay with face the nation welcome back this is face the nation what is brewing in the tea industry in sri lanka Um, I want to pose uh, start off <laughs> the final round uh, with uh, Roshan Rajwade, former chairman of the Planters Association of Ceylon. Um, Roshan, right now in Sri Lanka, there is a tug of war uh, when it comes to importation of uh, tea to liberalise the tea industry in Sri Lanka. The tea industry is divided. Uh, there is no second <coughs> word about it. Uh, when it comes to an issue like this. the tea industry is united but the factory owners are divided uh, when it comes to issues concerning everyone in the industry there's one section which is always uh, showing the red flag saying no this is not right with all these divisions in an industry that has been surviving for 150 years you still come here and say 
uh, there is so much of resilience that this industry has gone through in Sri Lanka. Do we still have a glimmer of hope for the tea industry in the country? And if so, yes, where are you seeing this? Yes, I, I believe moving? so because our industry has so many uh, stakeholders with varying interest. It's understood that each stakeholder will try to protect its interests and its sustainability in a manner that they feel is beneficial to them. But in major issues, I believe and we have demonstrated that we can come together, talk reason and arrive at a common goal that benefits everyone. Now even the tea importation issue, discussions are going on and if it benefits the grower whom I represent, I don't think there's any harm. But there, there needs to be a lot of discussions and open discussions about how and what form it will take. So I want to assure you that our industry has gone through challenging times in the last 150 years. No other industry in Sri Lanka with so much of history has gone through so many ups and downs. But we, uh, thanks to the resilience of the people in the industry, we are still alive and kicking and we are doing a good job. In fact, uh, okay, barring these things, we our prices are good. Our industry has uh, uh, revived itself at least last year and we hope that this trend will continue. And now our major challenge is the impending wage negotiations, and which I hope that all parties will see reason and come to a suitable arrangement and let the industry continue its, its good work. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Roshan Rajdure, former chairman of the Planters Association of Ceylon. I now move my attention to Rohan Fernando, former president of the Tea Exporters Association of uh, Sri Lanka. Rohan, next 18 months, next 12 months, 12 to 18 months in, for the tea industry in Sri Lanka. Where do you envisage we will move towards? Towards Will we see uh, the uh, banning of the licenses of these 53 uh, institutes? Will the tea prices in Sri Lanka reduce? Will at least the exporters now gain a competitive advantage because we know uh, the margins of many exporters have uh, drastically shrinked as a result of the increasing uh, tea prices in, in the local market in the country. How can we be competitive next 12 months? Can at least the exporters say, okay, this year is a good year for us? Because the planters said so the last year. Can the exporters come out and say, yes, okay, this is a good year for us? We can turn things around. You know, I think I always look at the positive side of the, uh, you know, even in a, in a difficult time, there are positives that you can look at. Uh, Ceylon tea has had a very good impression in the world market. As Roshan said, these little things that I got highlighted, I, I believe these were, you know, there's overreaction and we went too, too fast, too far with this uh, sugar issue. Now even today, most of the time we are discussing sugar. Whereas it's supposed to be 53, we don't know whether it's exactly 53, and I believe that we have put the car before the horse before finding out whether they are actually the wrongdoers and taken action. This is where the problem lies. But in the, in a, as a whole, I believe there's a lot of potential for Ceylon tea, the outside world. There are a lot of markets that we still haven't tapped into. And there are a lot of tea-based products that are still coming out. As a company, we are very hopeful 2018 is going to be a better year for us because Having gone through all the difficult times, we now understood where the niche is, what we have to avoid, mm. and where we have to, where we, where the our course has to be charted. Ron, very quickly before I move to uh, the other speaker, uh, you just said that the Ceylon tea has uh, a very good stand internationally at present. However, you are a very strong supporter of liberalising the tea industry in Sri Lanka as well. So that means that the Ceylon tea component will be reduced, we'll be opening up the floodgates, there'll be uh, tea coming into the country. And I'm trying to figure out now where you stand here, because you once say that Ceylon tea is important, and then you say the liberalizing of the tea industry is important. I'm trying to figure out where you stand in this equation. Now you have put words into my mouth, the floodgates. I never want floodgates open. Mm. What we are looking at is, look at how do you want this industry to grow as an export industry? Now, I must confess and I must, I firmly believe in my conviction that Ceylon tea industry, there are two major segments. 
the plantation sector and the export sector. These are two different industries. At one point in time, before the nationalization of the estate, it was one because the, the same plantation companies had their Colombo officers to export. But now there are two different segments. The government did see that these have to be segregated. During the Yahapalan era, there was a definite move to have the tea exports on the external trade ministry and the plantation on the plantation ministry. But it didn't, didn't happen. That is why we are saying the tea industry is divided when you take tea as a tea industry. We, are, we have failed to realize there are two segments, the plantation, which is a supply of raw material to the export industry. When you take the export industry, are we looking at the 320 million kilos that is manufactured in Sri Lanka or nearly 6 billion kilos of consumption and 1.5 billion kilos of export trade? That is my question. Whilst maintaining the purity of Ceylon tea and creating that for the niche market, there is yet more uh, the room to uh, move in if we are allowed to Thank you very much. take control of that 1.5 Thank you very much, uh, Rohan Fernando, former president uh, of the Tea Exporters Association of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, I now move uh, to uh, Mr. Jandra Karanatna, uh, chairman of the Tea Exporters Association of Sri Lanka. I must tell you, the most difficult task is uh, lying on your shoulder as far as the four panelists are concerned. The three of them are out of office right now, but you are the only one who is uh, sitting as uh, the uh, chairman of the Tea Export Association of Sri Lanka. Uh, so there's a lot of weight on your shoulders for sure, um, Ajayanta. So <clears throat> right now, there is a problem. The exporters are concerned. What is the next step? You know, exporters are having a serious issue. One thing, as you said, the internal issues. The sugar, the, the residues, all kinds of things. The in the industry. <laughs> yeah, that is one issue. Now, externally, we have a lot of issues. If you analyze the, the Sri Lanka tea exports, all our buying markets are in trouble. The Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, Iraq, Syria, all are having problems. Russian ruble devaluated more than 100% during the last four years. Turkey about 40% during the last one year. So we are under pressure from all these markets because they, their buying power has reduced. And you know, compared to that, Sri Lanka depreciated is very small, only 3.2% during this year. So we have to supply. So you know, the, the profits or the margins or you know, the, whatever the, you know, either the export has to lose or they can't do in any of the promotion or marketing work or research or we cannot spend any money on these. So the exporters are having a serious issue right now. So, you know, we all look at now, you know, even this conversation, 90% of the time spent on the, the, the producer side. Yeah, you look at those adulteration, but those are, are very important to us. But, you know, we have much more serious issues outside. Mm -hmm. So if you don't uh, attend to or uh, address those issues, as Rohan said, we need special attention in these areas. So if you don't have focus on this and try to resolve these issues, you will be in, in trouble in the, in the near future. So you think, you, you mean to say that 150 years, another 150 years is not possible, the way we are going right now? No, you know, not that I'm saying that, but we need to solve it. We need a lot of attention and focus on solving, solving these issues. If we neglect these things, we will have a serious issue in the near future. But I think as we all believe that we will get adjusted at some stage, you know, as we are trying to settle the, the issues of residue levels and the sugar, the outside issues also, some are beyond our control. But we can do many things to, uh, you know, do this. But we are happy about the prices. But, you know, this will not remain at this level for a longer period. Thank you very much, uh, Jant Karanath, the chairman of the Tea Exporters Association of Sri Lanka. Uh, to be fair by our viewers, uh, Jant, I need to mention uh, to, uh, with your permission, of course, that uh, Face the Nation has brought up the issues of the exporters a couple of times. We've had um, Rohan Fernando, we've had uh, Meryl J. Fernando, who represents Dilma, 
uh, and several others, including uh, Roshan, on this very forum, on this very show, expressing their views about uh, the exporters, the challenges that the exporters of uh, Sri Lanka are facing. We've had four shows so far for the last nine months. That's quite a number. Uh, and today we thought we'll allocate some time for the adulteration of tea, mainly because of the emails that we got requesting that we discuss about this topic. Uh, I now move my attention to uh, Dr. Rohan Petyaguda, former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. Uh, Dr. Petyaguda, um, what would be your message to the Minister of Plantations, uh, leaving aside your relationship with him professionally, if you were to advise him about the future of the tea industry, uh, being in the helm of the Tea Board for two and a half years, what would that advice be? I think you have to see, as Rohan mentioned, that we have two tea industries. <clears throat> there is a service tea industry, which is the exporters, who are the value adders, and there is a production tea industry. In the truly long term, the production tea industry is going to shrink. Unfortunately, we have to bear that in mind, because no highly developed economy can also have a mass production agriculture. It's, it's very difficult to do. Large countries which, with large domestic markets can afford to do that. But Sri Lanka has a very small domestic market for its tea. Only about 5% is consumed locally. We need to realize that our per capita gross national income in Sri Lanka now is about $12,000 a year. That's a World Bank figure. Kenya, by comparison, is $3,200 per year. The Kenyan cost of living is so low that Kenya can produce tea at a fraction of the price that Sri Lanka can produce tea. So by having the exporters on the one hand captive and forced to buy Ceylon tea only, it's unfair to them because they're trying to build up a service economy that is looking at value addition and exports. On the other hand, we have two million stakeholders dependent on the production industry at the moment. But that industry is going to shrink with time. We are going to end up like the South Korean or Japanese tea industry, which is high value, but small volume. And that means fewer people in the tea industry. Now, if you ask Roshan, for example, how easy it is, it is to find labor in the tea industry, he'll tell you it's very difficult because people are walking away from the tea industry because people don't want to do manual labor any longer. The aspiration of young Sri Lankans, the Sri Lankans that we are educating at huge cost, is not to be a plantation worker. Their aspiration is to go beyond that. So I think it's going to be a challenge to run a mass production tea industry in the future. The future lies in the exporters and in value addition, and managing that tension is the biggest challenge that a plantations industries minister will have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Petyago, the former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. I need to thank uh, Roshan Rajdure, former chairman of Plant Association of Ceylon, for joining us uh, tonight on the thank show. Jayanta Karanatna, chairman of the Tea Exporters Association of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Rohan Petyaguda, former chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board. Uh, Dr. Petyaguda is a man with a lot of integrity and working with you for the last two and a half years. Being an exporter myself, uh, I have had the <coughs> immense pleasure, uh, Dr. Petyaguda, and a salute to you for the job well done for the last two and a half years. And thank you very much, uh, Rohan Fernando, former president of the Tea Exporters Association of Sri Lanka, the very vocal individual indeed in the tea industry in the country. Uh, you speak about the word gentleman. To be very honest, uh, Rohan, it's like the bane in this country. You see the political hierarchy in Sri Lanka. We speak about gentlemen's politics. It doesn't happen. You speak about the gentleman's trade that is being riddled with corruption. You speak about the gentleman's game in Sri Lanka. That too, unfortunately, is riddled with corruption. Thank you very much, Nadine. Thank you very much, uh, Charita, for joining us this evening on the show. It's always a pleasure to listen to the two of you as well uh, on Face the Nation. I leave you tonight with a quote, as I always do. A deception may give us what we want for the present, but it will always take it away in the end. Take care. Thank you.